Okay, so uh, the, f- the example from chapter 14 that Brian gives is the feeding of the 4,000 and uh, how are we going to get all this food even though they had seen it previously done. Other examples. Just, we're listing them off here. Peter sinking in the water. Okay, that was in chapter 14. Okay, not there yet. That's, we're only looking at 14 and 15 right now. Thank you, Albert. Other things from 14 and 15. Explain the parable. That's in 15, right? One more maybe we'll take if you have an example of slow disciples. Greg? Greg? Uh, didn't understand his compassion. We'll say that. Okay. All we're trying to do as we start out here is establish that there may be something going on. (laughs) There may be a pattern in the stories that Matthew is telling. Uh, Remember, we're looking at sections of narrative or sections of teaching in the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, as Michael alluded to on Sunday... The one we're currently in is a longer section of narrative uh, than what we've seen before. From 14 to 17, we're saying, is one section. And so already in the first half, we are seeing these and more um, examples of the disciples being a little bit slow to understand what Jesus is doing, uh, slow to understand what he is saying. And so maybe there is a theme uh, in uh, in these stories that Matthew is weaving together, okay? So, with that in mind, let's jump in. I want to read two different sections of our text for tonight. We're going to try to look at both chapters 16 and 17. Uh, But we'll begin with two separate readings from this section. The first being the first 12 verses of chapter 16. And then we're going to skip and jump to chapter 17, verse 14, and read a passage there. Uh, Again, with this theme in mind of the disciples being a little bit slow. So let's begin with reading Matthew 16, 1 to 12. The Pharisees and Sadducees came up, and testing Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. But he replied to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. And the disciples came to the other side of the sea, but they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, Watch out, and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They began to discuss this among themselves, saying, He said that because we did not bring any bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not understand or remember the five loaves of the five thousand, how many baskets full we picked up? Or seven loaves of the four thousand, how many large baskets full you picked up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not say to beware the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Okay, and let's skip over to chapter 17. Hold that reading alongside this one. Chapter 17, verse 14 to 21. When they came to the crowd, a man came to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, 
Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will, be, it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Okay, the question I have for you, uh, just one aspect of reading these two stories here. Um, what does Jesus say is the problem of the disciples? All right, little faith is one we'll put up here. And where does Jesus say that? Uh, 17, right? 17 verse 20. Other things or other ways of Jesus diagnosing their problem? Well, they were unable to cast out the demon, and Jesus says that's because of the littleness of their faith. The other things that Jesus says, well, we're trying to highlight Jesus' words here, uh, so sorry, Dan, if I didn't make that quite clear enough, but highlighting Jesus' diagnosis here. Yeah, uh, and the phrase little faith is again, right, in, or I should say first, in 16 verse 8, okay? And when, as Dan points out, they uh, were confused about him saying, uh, talking about bread, they thought he meant that they didn't bring enough bread, okay? Are there other things uh, that Jesus diagnoses other than the littleness of their faith, which is a repeated phrase here? What does he say in 1611, Alex? Okay. Uh, not, do not understand. Okay. Uh, it turns out, so we've identified two things here. He says they lack faith and they lack understanding. Uh, turns out, if we look back at some of the stories that we were reviewing when class started, uh, these are the two things Jesus has already identified. In the story of G Peter uh, walking and then sinking in the lake, uh, he says, Jesus says in verse 14 and 31, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And then uh, in the story also referred to in chapter 15, when they have to, uh, uh, it's Peter actually again, that asks the explanation of the parable. Uh, Jesus says, are you still lacking, just sorry, verse, chapter 15, verse 16, are you still lacking in understanding also? Okay. So in chapter 14, he says they have little faith. In chapter 15, he says they lack understanding. In chapter 16, he says both, you have little faith and you lack understanding. And then in chapter 17, he says again that they um, have a littleness of faith. By the way, also in chapter 17, verse 17, he says they are an unbelieving and perverted generation. Okay, so the question we want to explore then is what does this mean? What does it mean that they have a small faith and that they lack understanding? And in order to get a better picture of that or a more full understanding of what Jesus means when he says they lack faith and understanding, we are going to look at the stories of Peter in this section as a representative of these other, uh, of all the disciples. But the thing is, we'll, we'll see it in these stories, and I think we've seen it before. Um, for instance, that, that uh, passage we referenced in chapter 15, verse 15, when Peter says, explain the parable to us, okay, it's pretty obvious Peter is asking that on behalf of the disciples. That's fairly common that Peter will be the one to speak up and say what everyone else is thinking. 
Um, well, three times in chapters 16 and 17, uh, there is a story that specifically involves Peter. And uh, we're going to see if maybe Peter is representative of all the disciples. And by looking at these stories of Peter, we can understand what Jesus is, is diagnosing when he says that the disciples have a little faith and that they lack understanding. Okay? The first one we're going to do together um, over the next five minutes or so. And then, uh, then I'll give you guys time uh, to do the other two in, uh, in groups. Uh, but let's start with this first one in chapter 16. And we'll pick up reading where we had stopped earlier. Chapter 16, verse 13. And we'll read down to verse 23. Again, a lot of things we could talk about, but we want to focus on Peter and what he, is, uh, what he has, what he's lacking, why he might be lacking those things, and um, you know, the implications of, of that. Uh, failure, okay? Chapter 16, verse 13 to 23. It says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's okay two questions i have uh, for you these will be the two questions you'll be exploring in your own groups and other stories but the first question is what is peter missing and the sub question is and it's more speculative why might peter be missing uh you know this 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 uh whatever he's missing whatever he's failing at try, try to explain it but what is peter missing as is revealed in this story. Hey, Brian? What's interesting to me is this is Peter declaring to Jesus that you are the Christ, the Messiah, uh, the Son of God. And then when Jesus gives instructions on what he needs to do in this life, he rebukes him and tells, no, you're wrong. I know better. This is not going to happen to you. And so it that sounds like little faith and little understanding. I guess they both go together. Thank you, Brian. Uh, what else? I don't know if you're gearing up, Brian, for, or sorry, Michael, for a hand, but uh, what else do you want to say? And maybe you can address the sub-question here, since uh, Brian's laid out what Peter missed on this occasion. He says, no, Jesus, this is not going to happen to you. But I want to try to take a crack at explaining why Peter responds this way. physical torment and pain that Jesus will experience in that ultimate plan that he has of salvation for us. Okay, thank you, Taylor. Michael? I think he has uh, an idea of how he thinks things need to go, and um, you know, when Jesus says it's going to go differently than that, he's not willing to accept that. And so there's, that has to do with you know, just kind of trusting, I think, and letting go of how you think things should go. So two different contrasts here. Taylor identifies the contrast between the plan, the eternal plan of salvation, I think is the phrase that he used, and the temporal that that Peter seems to be focusing on. Michael identifies a a different kind of contrast uh, that is uh, clearly related, which is the contrast between what Peter wanted, what he thought, and what, you know, God and his will was, okay? Um, We've 
maybe already started to answer this question, but the second question is, this story here in chapter 16, verse 13 to 23, uh, with Peter confessing and then saying, Jesus, no, you're not going to die. Um, how would you match this up with the diagnosis, the description we've already seen from Jesus, that his disciples lack faith and that they lack understanding? How does Peter, if at all, how does he demonstrate this, uh, these two Failures here of faith and understanding. Your granny? That was not going to be that way. So is that to you a lack? Uh, granny says he rebukes Christ. Does that seem to you to be a lack of faith or a lack of understanding? Probably both. <laughs> Albert, you want to chime in here? hard because I want to pull other texts from other, you know, scripture stuff, but Peter repeatedly has shown to me that he will give of his life before Christ gives of his. And I just take this, you know, he pulls him aside and doesn't make a fanfare, but I, I just can't help but sense there's an aspect of this isn't going to happen because I will die before I let them take you down. So it, it's a love and it's it's just a pure love for Jesus and what he is and who he is, that he's like, I'm not going to let that happen to you. And Jesus is like, you don't understand. This has to happen. And so it's just Peter still not getting, you do have to die. Yeah, uh, let's do Greg and then Brian. I think what, at the same time, please. I think what, I think what underlies everything is they still don't understand the nature of the kingdom. And because of that, they don't understand the nature of the king. And we see that all through the scriptures, all through, even up until the ascension, you know, it's at the ascension or just prior to the ascension when Jesus says he opened their mind to understand the scriptures. And what's, what's contrasting to me is the Canaanite woman got it. The thief on the cross got it. But still those that were closest to him still weren't getting it, you know. And, and I think... There's multiple reasons for that. I think one is it provided opportunities for him to teach others while he was also teaching them and preparing them to be able to teach others when he was no longer with them. Thank you, Greg. Brian? Well, another curiosity. Uh, not only does he rebuke the Messiah that he declared to be the Messiah, the Son of God, and has witnessed all these miracles, but here's the curiosity is that Jesus said, I'm going to die, but I'm going to be resurrected. Now, there's a giant miracle, and if at minimum, I think, I would say, I don't understand. Can you explain that further? As opposed to, no, nope, that ain't happening. So I think we, we've touched on both of these things to some degree, right? Uh, several of you have made comments about... Uh, lack of Peter to trust, right? Uh, this may be, you know, Brian's just touched on this. Yeah, things are going to be hard to understand, but there's a whole other level to just to, to, to step up and say, you know, no, I, I'm not even willing to, you know, go along or trust you, even though I don't understand. There's clearly a lack of faith, lack of trust. Uh, notice, um, actually, well, I'll say that and just identify that in a second. Um, but a lack of trust in, in uh, Jesus's plan but then several of you also hit on this idea of understanding. Um, think about Greg's language about understanding the nature of the kingdom. I mean, think of how prevalent a theme that's already been in the Gospel of Matthew. And so here Peter, again, I think as representative of the disciples, demonstrating a failure to grasp what the true nature of the kingdom is. Okay? So hopefully in this story, we're starting to see how a, a lack of faith, which again, lack of trust, um, goes hand in hand with the failure, the failure to understand uh, Jesus, understand his nature, understand his purpose, okay? Uh, but this is the main points of what we've seen so far. So Peter and the disciples, they're not totally lost. They're not totally hopeless. I mean, Peter identifies uh, who Jesus is. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Um, there's a definitive declaration of his, his faith and his understanding, um, and Jesus praises him for that, uh, commends him for that. I feel like it, it, it's probably necessary to at least comment on the, uh, 
you know, what, what it has been to, to some, a confusing passage about Peter and the rock upon which Jesus will build his church. Um, there's cases to be made for what that rock is. I'll just say briefly that we shouldn't shy away from thinking the rock could be Peter just because uh, certain people, the Catholic Church primarily, has built so much on this passage as if Peter is, holds this, you know, exalted position, which I think even this passage would demonstrate uh, Christ meant no such thing when he said these words to Peter. Uh, but if you, again, if you think of Peter as representative of the apostles, okay, um, Ephesians chapter 2 says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. And so uh, Jesus had this kind of foundational role for the apostles. And so it could be that Jesus is pointing uh, to that fact and seeing Peter as representative. Um, even if you do it, even if, you know, without the rock comment, uh, he still says some pretty direct and significant things to Peter. I give you the keys of the kingdom, right? What you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. By the way, the grammar of that is significant. What you bind on earth will have been bound. This is not, you know, the apostles decide something on earth and then God changes his mind accordingly. It's that the apostles are carrying out things that have already been decided in heaven. And so they serve as his representatives in that way. But still, these are uh, strong statements of the role, uh, not of, you know, great authority and, you know, being the Pope and, you know, deciding how everything goes. No, they, they serve a vital role as the representatives of Christ on earth, and um, they are going to play this pivotal role in unlocking the kingdom in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10 uh, for both the Jews and the Gentiles. And so Peter expresses this great statement of faith. He is commended by uh, the Lord. Notice that he's commended for uh, this being revealed not by flesh and blood, but by my Father who is in heaven. So we have this contrast between God's things and man's things. And, Je and Peter is only able to say, you are the Christ, because he's learned that from God. And so in that sense, you might say his understanding is correct. He's trusting in God and God's revelation, what he's seen in the miracles and in the words of Jesus. And so he's commended for that. But then, when he starts to hear Jesus talk about suffering... Uh, he does not understand that. He does not have the faith to trust Jesus, so he tries to rebuke him. And as strong as the language was of Jesus commending Peter, he turns right around and uses equally as strong language to rebuke him. You're a Satan. You're an adversary. You're an enemy to me, Peter. Um, and then there's the same formula, just reversed. You are setting your mind on man's interest not on god's interest so in that moment not only is he lacking the understanding but he's not trusting in god and god's things he's trying to do it his way or according to man's ways okay um so two other stories in this section matthew 16 and 17 that involve peter and this is going to be for you to uh to talk about so what did we do before i think it worked well group one you'll be right here in the middle you're going to be uh the first eight verses of chapter 17 the story of the transfiguration so 17, 1 to 8. Group 2 will be everybody else, okay? So the back row is not exempt from class activity. Uh, but if you're in the back, the side section or the three of you in that far section, uh, you're group 2. And you'll be looking at the short but confusing story in chapter 17, verse 24 to 27. So take a few minutes here. Read these passages uh, with your, your cohorts here. And then ask the same two questions. What is Peter missing? Why might he be missing that? And how does it match with the description of little faith and little understanding? Take a few minutes to do that in your groups there. Okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and report out. It sounds like some good conversations. But for sake of time, let's start with uh, group one. I'll give you about four minutes each to uh, share the things that you talked about. So... Group one, you can briefly summarize if you want, but uh, what is Peter's problem in this story, and uh, how does he represent the little faith and lack of understanding that Jesus says is typical of his disciples? We have two, uh, two microphones swar uh, we're prowling around here. Brian? Well, we have Peter who has already declared that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, 
And then in the Mount of Transfiguration, sort of a definitive proof of Christ's deity is that he is transfigured into his true uh, countenance, his heavenly divine countenance. In 1 John 1, 5, God is light. So here you have this brilliant light, and he misses the point. Said, well, well, let's build a couple tents here to house uh, you guys. And it's sort of like God said, got their attention. Hold on. This is my son whom I will please listen to him. And then at that juncture, he became afraid. And uh, so I don't know that he fully understood his declaration of faith back when he said that Jesus was the son of God. When presented with that fact, he um, didn't respond accordingly. Let me put it that way. You don't build tents when you're standing there in the presence of God. Thank you, Brian. Other things in group one that you guys discuss about Peter's failure in the transfiguration. Yeah, Michael? As far as understanding goes, it seems kind of like uh, P P Peter didn't understand what was happening in front of the significance of it. Or, you know, or perhaps, I don't know, it's a little tricky, you know, but it seems like the initial reaction would have been one of just like worship or just a observation, like taking it in kind of a thing. Um, but he decides like to propose something instead of, I don't know, it just seems out of place, like kind of what, what Brian was saying, you know, it's like you're in the presence of that and, you know, Christ and he's transfigured, you know, it seems like you would wait to, to hear something or to see what's going to happen next, you know, and just kind of humble yourself take a more passive kind of role. Thank you, Michael. 90 seconds left for group one to comment on uh, this story here. Peter's lack of faith, lack of understanding. Maybe uh, Mike touched on it, but we have other instances with men encountered angels. And man, they prostrate themselves before the angel and want to worship and said, no, 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 I, I, you only worship God. So here he is confronted with or given the honor of recognizing he's standing in the presence of God. And his first reaction is not one of worship. And I think Mike mentioned that, but I'd emphasize it again. So I'm going to do a little bit of uh, interpreting so you guys can tell me if I'm wrong. But from what I hear... Uh, I would say perhaps the connection to their lack of faith is Peter's failure to worship. I'm gonna just not going to write his name because we know he's the main character here. Uh, failure to worship. And again, I, what I mean by that is what Michael and Brian have both commented on. Not that he was not worshipful at all. Not that he had no reverence. But the, the fact that, uh, you know, Michael says he looks to make a proposal instead of just humbling himself, uh, perhaps, again, just in terms of not trusting fully in God, that is an evidence of that. And then uh, not understanding, this was to Brian's comment, uh, what he just said, the Son of God, his uh, comment. And uh, we should, maybe we should, we should be, you know, fair to Peter uh, to some degree uh, because it says that he did not know what he was saying. Uh, is that, that's in this, um, is that in this version or is that in one of the other uh, gospel writers? Yeah. Um, well, sorry about that. I thought that was here in Matthew, but um, one, one of the accounts says he didn't know what he was saying. So maybe we just, you know, say, okay, well, if he didn't understand what he was saying, then we're not going to try to make sense of it either. Uh, but still, his comment, I think, betrays a lack of understanding of, as Brian mentioned, what he's just said, that Jesus is the Son of God, which is a singular declaration, which is what the voice from heaven clarifies. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Okay. Um, the fish story, group two. Uh, what's Peter's failure, and how does it represent the general failure of the disciples? Yeah, first of all, you got to explain what's even going on. Right? You know, so I gave you, there's less verses, but harder, maybe harder to understand what's going on. What's Peter's failure? Yeah. 
Right on, Robert. A plus gold star. All right, so uh, Alex is speaking, you know, without the microphone. So we'll go to Ian first and then come back to Alex so we can hear what he has to say. I don't know. I'm kind of winging it here. But um, I I guess it kind of reminds me of the situation where they had forgot the bread on the boat with Jesus. And he's talking to them about the leaven. And they think he's talking about actual bread. But he's talking about the you know, the teachings of the Pharisees and whatnot. So he's completely missing the point, but then on on the, the other hand, uh, there's a situation where they're lacking for something physical, and they're kind of forgetting the fact that Jesus just fed 5,000 people with a few loaves of bread, and w- will take care of them. So in this situation, it's like uh, he's got this misunderstanding that you know they don't need to pay tax. I guess here in this situation is how I read it. Like he's saying. Basically, we don't pay taxes. Am, am I reading that right? Like that's, and uh, and Jesus says, um, "Here's a way you can get the taxes." You've, in my eyes, I'm saying it like Peter's a fisherman. You have have this skill. Go out and fish. And in this case, he's telling them the fish will have a coin in it. But if you think kind of more meta than that, it's like you have this skill. You have a way to pay these taxes. Why create? Uh, a disturbance when you can still follow the law and be a Christian and you know kind of follow out the the order that I've laid out for you thank you Ian uh, thanks for jumping in there on a difficult passage uh, before I get to some of the stuff you said I want to hear what Alex had to say he has to pay his dues so to speak for speaking up oh uh, well I don't know, it just kind of seems that he's kind of, uh, kind of goes along with what Ian's kind of explaining, I think, but um, he, he's asking him if he pays taxes, and he's saying, well, no. Well, why doesn't he? And he's, well, he's a king, right? All right. And so kings don't pay taxes. Then he asks him, he's like, well, where do the kings get their, their stuff from, from strangers or from the their sons? And he says, strangers. And he says, well, then sons are free. He says, but nevertheless, we don't want to offend anybody. So you have to do something. You have to go and get it. Go throw a hook out into the thing, and and you'll get it inside the mouth. But it's I almost feel like you know God is providing, or Jesus is providing that for him in some way. I guess I don't know. So maybe maybe the disciples, and consequently us, maybe we're the sons here. He's talking about. So, uh, yeah, Taylor, you want to jump? Yeah, yeah. sorry, this was not my section, but I, I think it's. <laughs> It does seem like it's somewhat bridging what, what the whole thing that seems to be flying over the heads of the, the apostles is the difference between the divinity of God versus the earthly nature. Taxes being collected, in this case, are, are of an earthly thing, and, and he's relating that, it seems, to a heavenly thing. Him being the king of heaven would obviously not, not you know, people would be paying homage to him or taxes to him in this case, and, and yet he's still suggesting that they pay the taxes in the case of, of this earthly situation. And it seems to, I don't know if that's very well said, it seems to be so much bridging the divide between the nature of God and Jesus in, in the heavenly sense and, and him in this earthly vessel or, or situation that he's currently in, right? And hopefully that makes sense, I don't know. Yeah, so uh, to answer our questions here, uh, so the nature, uh, several of, among the three comments here, na- Jesus' nature, I'm going out of order here. This would be to the, the second one. Not understanding the nature of Jesus as king, uh, or perhaps maybe more specifically the son of the king, maybe the idea, okay? Uh, but still, his ability to provide uh, does seem to uh, play a prominent role in this story as well, which, as Ian points out, connects us back to some other stories in which the apostles lack the trust in Jesus to provide. So I'll just say this. I do think, as you're maybe remembering, or you're remembering in the future, that later in Matthew, Jesus will tell people to pay taxes to Caesar, and that's some, not something you should shirk, okay? So I think it is significant here that this is the temple tax. And if you think about the temple being the presence of God, Jehovah God, Jesus being the Son of God, God in the flesh— uh, he's saying, well, wait a second, if the, temp- if the tax is for the temple, you, you know, you think I'm subject to paying that tax? You know? 
Um, the, and he gives the example of the children of the king being exempt from the taxes. Okay, this is not the United States of America. Okay, there there have been other cultures and and you know nations in the world in which uh, the sons of royalty you know got off from their citizenry obligations. Um, but uh, he said, and Jordan, you you mentioned about our status as sons. I think there is something to tease out, not from our, you know, releasing our obligation from paying taxes, but this idea that sons are free, okay? And yet, I think each of you that commented, commented on the fact that although Jesus really isn't responsible to pay the tax, he still sees this as, you know, um, an opportunity to show that he is willing to submit, okay? That God can provide, one, but that he's willing to submit, Jesus doesn't flaunt his freedom and say, no, I don't have to pay the tax. I'm going to go, you know, right up to the temple officials and say, I'm the son of God, nana, nana, boo, boo. I don't have to pay the tax, you know. He says, no. Well, one, maybe for Peter's sake, okay. Peter, Peter said he'd pay the tax, so not to embarrass Peter, we'll pay the tax. And maybe also just for the sake of submitting to an authority, even though the reality is sons are free, okay. Um, so maybe it tells us more about Jesus than about his disciples, but uh, there is something there. Okay, one minute left here. I think the answer to all of this lies in the fact that Jesus is beginning to uh, predict his own death. And because he is uh, starting to predict his own suffering and death, that provides him with the, uh, the material or the opportunity to inform, correct the understanding of the disciples about what the nature of the kingdom is really all about. So these verses are wrong. We're picking up after this in 1624 when it says that Jesus says to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the son of man is going to come in the glory of his father and his angels will repay every man according to his deeds. And then he says in verse 28, there are some of those standing here who will not see death until the Son of Man comes in his kingdom. Okay, so they don't quite get it. They don't under understand the nature of the kingdom. They're still holding on to their desires. They're not quite fully grasping Jesus and who he is. So what is Jesus' prescription for this illness? Um, lacking in faith and understanding? Well, you've got to embrace this as an upside-down kingdom. This is, this is a kingdom where you give up your life to save it. This is a kingdom uh, where you give up everything to gain everything. Right? It's not like the kingdoms of the world. That's one thing that these disciples and us need to understand. Lacking in faith and understanding? Uh, trying to hold on to your own desires? Well, Jesus says to imitate his own self-denial. If he's going to suffer and die, then you know whatever that means, well, the disciples, we have to carry our crosses, uh, the self-denial, denying ourselves every day, following him, giving up of our life. And to that point, we should not be fooled. That may be one of the things that's going on with the disciples. The disciples, like many in their society, are so attracted by power and material wealth and position and authority and all that. That's, that's counterfeit life. That's not real life. That's not real fulfilling, satisfying. That's not eternal life. Um, so don't be fooled by that, Jesus says. You give up all of that. And you gain something much greater. And in the end, the, the real antidote uh, to all of this lack of understanding of faith is to keep your eyes on Jesus. We could go back to that story of Peter struggling to walk on the water. Keep your eyes on Jesus, on the coming of his kingdom, which he talks about, on the coming judgment when he will repay each man according to his deeds. But you focus on him, you give up yourself, you don't get distracted by the counterfeit of the world, and you embrace this upside-down kingdom that Jesus is uh, bringing, establishing here in this gospel. Okay, I'll uh, spare you the review. There's the story up till now. Maybe Robert can go over this on Sunday as he transitions into chapter 18. So uh, we'll look forward to that on Sunday. Thank you, everybody.